Every single minute of every day, about two truckloads of plastic get dumped into streams, rivers and seas around the world. Here we've only captured a fraction of what's really in the river. Plastic is part of our daily life, but we have to do something to change this. We can't just invade a natural environment with plastic. Microplastics can now be found everywhere in our food, in Arctic sea ice, in the deep sea. Plastic is incredibly long-lasting. I find that quite threatening. And when organisms are affected by it, then we have to do something about it. If we don't act now, the amount of plastic in our seas will have increased fourfold by 2050. Come rain or shine, Ciccio Marangione heads out onto the Mar Piccolo, just like his forefathers. This small sea basin connected to the Mediterranean is his stamping ground. Buongiorno, ragazzi. Mussels have been grown here for centuries in the shallow waters of the little sea. In the past, hemp or cotton nets were used. But mussel farmers switched to polypropylene in the late 1960s, and all too often, nets end up floating free in the sea. Ciccio Marangioni sees the impact every day. The plastic on the seabed starves marine vegetation of oxygen and it suffocates. The effect on the environment is severe. The sea is like a mama. It's brimming with love. But when a child doesn't behave well, she still loves them. But she doesn't respect them as much as a kind one. Fifty years of muscle breeding with plastic nets has turned the Mar Piccolo into a trash heap. Every year, ghost nets measuring an area of 78,000 square kilometers, the same size as the Czech Republic, end up floating in our seas. Mussels grow in tubular polypropylene nets. Over time, salt water, sun, and friction break down the plastic, but it can take 450 years to completely decompose, and toxic substances get released. The 49-year-old is no longer prepared to be a part of that. He's been taking part in a scientific experiment since 2021 and only uses nets made from Matter B, a bioplastic based on maize starch. Most muscle breeders are suspicious of this new material. You have to be a very good muscle breeder to work with Matter B nets. It's more work than with normal plastic. Un poco di più di lavorazione della plastica. The bioplastic is biodegradable and compostable. It could prove a more eco-friendly alternative to conventional plastic. They're testing whether the new material fulfills Ciccio Marangioni's requirements. If these nets had only lasted six rather than 18 months, then I would have lost my entire mussel harvest. I took a big risk. I've invested my time and energy in this endeavor for the sake of the environment. Ghost nets made from plastic often end up as death traps, killing creatures, impacting entire submarine habitats, destroying biodiversity. The people who live from and with the sea have first-hand experience of that. That's why nets made of new materials are being tested in Europe and Asia. Marine biologist Chiara Giomi is testing bioplastic and its environmental impact. After all, many of us eat this seafood. I'm really interested in finding out whether the nets make a difference to the quantity of mussels harvested. 
and also whether the material of the nets could lead to an increase or decrease in the number of tiny organisms living on or in the mussels. Okay. Together with Chiara Giomi and her colleague Serena Scozzafava, the mussel farmer wants to find out whether the bioplastic nets will stand the test of time. Most plastic gets washed into the sea by rivers, here in Germany too. It's amazing what's floating in the Rhine. All of this in just two weeks. Nikolaus Schweigert was no longer prepared to sit back and watch the rising tide of plastic. He set up an association called Kraka, which is also the name of its floating litter collector. It's made of a basket attached to two pontoons. The open side faces into the current and captures the trash as it floats past. The association's members designed the litter collector together with an engineering company and had it assembled in a shipyard. For two years, they fought with the authorities to get Germany's first ever riverborne litter collector approved. What we have found has given me a really nasty shock. We're seeing the result of the first rain in a long time. Water levels have risen by about 50 centimeters, so everything left lying by the river over the past few months has been swept up. You can see that here. Everything from shoes, bottles, fireworks from last year. There are lighters. Everything that people have left behind on the riverbanks. We're finding it here. Crazy. We weren't expecting so much. As well as a lot of hard work and conviction, 160,000 euros of donations have been invested in the litter collector, which has to be emptied every two weeks by the volunteers. Our trash collector is about three meters wide, but the river measures about 200 meters across at this point. So there's a lot of trash that just goes floating past. And I think that we should be worried. We don't have any kind of control of what's floating past every day in the Rhine of how much trash there is there. Whatever the environmental activists don't retrieve from the river ends up in the sea. It's estimated that the Rhine washes about a metric ton of plastic into the North Sea every day. Some of it can hardly be seen with the naked eye. Look, plastic granules everywhere. Biologist Leandra Hamann is conducting research in this field, but she wanted to do more. She decided to get involved with the Rhine litter collector in her spare time. This is just a normal piece of wood and a feather, but there's a lot of microplastic on them. That's because these things collect on the surface and microplastics also float to the surface. You can even see what kind of microplastic it is, and that's pretty rare. These are plastic pellets. They're used to produce plastic products, and sometimes they get lost by accident, from ships, containers, or sacks that split during transport, and the pellets get lost. Or during production, when the factories are cleaned, they go down the drain. To be honest, I wouldn't have expected there to be so much microplastic. The litter collector has been given a one-year permit. The members want to use this time to collect information about the quantity and type of trash in the Rhine. There's no data of this kind at present. The volunteers sort the trash according to specific criteria. The EU has created about 200 categories. Many litter collecting associations sort the trash according to those categories. It allows different regions to be compared. We enter the data into an app and it's fed directly into a large database. Ultimately, it allows us to link it with water levels, weather conditions, etc. and helps us gauge what's in the river at what particular time. 
Leander Hamann from the University of Bonn is evaluating the findings in a long-term study. She's especially interested in the microplastics washed into the Rhine litter collector. An estimated 330,000 tons of microplastics escape into the environment in Germany each year. That's about four kilograms per capita. Reliable data about the quantity and type of microplastic found in rivers is a valuable political instrument. Pollution can only be curbed if limits are introduced for microplastics. Some microplastics are a lot, lot smaller than this. They're there, but we can't see them. I'd say that once microplastics get into the environment, it's too late. So it's really important that we start at source and look where they're being created and how they're getting into the environment, and then take measures to reduce that. Up to now, the microparticles have ended up in the litter collector more or less by chance. Leandra Hamann is working on a system intended to filter out microplastics. This group of friends love the sea, but are themselves part of the plastic problem. Thomas Servetti dives and surfs. We surfers feel very connected to the sea. It's our playground. At the same time, we also add to the pollution, even if we're not always aware of it. Everything we use is petroleum-based. Our surfboards, the leash that connects us to our boards, our wetsuits, the wax, and all the other accessories. And they're often produced on the other side of the planet. Manufacturing surfing equipment isn't eco-friendly, and the products are rarely recycled. That has long worried Thomas Servetti and his friends Basile Jonsi and Nicolas Thibault. In 2015, they got to know each other in Malaysia and tested out the region's top surf spots together. The ocean in Southeast Asia contains masses of plastic. You can literally collect it while you are swimming. Rivers wash all the dirt into the sea after stormy weather. About 80% of plastic trash gets washed into the seas and oceans via rivers or from the coast. The other 20% is made up of fishing nets, ropes and abandoned fishing boats. The three water sports enthusiasts want to help slash the use of plastic, also in the production of surfboards and surf equipment. We were really shocked by the sheer madness of this pollution. It was why I ended up doing the project that I'm doing. With Nomads, we wanted to create an alternative to the conventional surf industry. Nomad Surfing makes accessories and boards from sustainable and recycled materials. The surfers want to be a source of inspiration to the industry's major players. They even quit their well-paid jobs to embark on this adventure. We knew we were starting from nothing and didn't have the necessary expertise. It was obvious it would be hard. We said to ourselves, if we're going to do this, then it should be for a sport that we share a passion for. And so we decided on the surf industry. The complex mix of materials and synthetic fibers, which frequently contain toxic substances, make it very complicated to recycle water and outdoor sports equipment. When summer's over, a lot of inflatable mattresses, bodyboards, and swim aids end up on the trash heap along with wetsuits. The entrepreneurs see them as a potential raw material. They've put out a box for old wetsuits in a branch of a major sports chain. When wetsuit fabric gets recycled, it can lose its durability and become porous. New technologies are needed. But Nicolas Thibault knows from working for big companies that they prefer to use fresh materials. It costs money to process waste products. It takes a very long time to change an industrial process. We can do that a lot more quickly. We're already producing 500 surf leashes a day. Our advantage is that we're very agile in contrast to the industry giants.
the pioneers are proving that it is possible to recycle wetsuit fabric and showing the big names how it's done. We're cutting out rectangular areas like this, which we use to produce new surf equipment, like leashes, for example. That's the item that keeps the board and the surfer connected. Good recycling ideas are vital. Only 9% of plastic worldwide gets recycled, 19% is incinerated, 50% ends up on the trash heap, 22% is illegally dumped. The nomads want to use up every last little bit of the discarded wetsuits. The surf entrepreneurs sell the products via their own online store. Their next goal is to supply big companies too. A lot of bits get left over. We cut them into pieces and then shred them into neoprene scraps, which we turn into new products like yoga mats, surf pads or new material. The traction pads are produced via a secret process from a mixture of those wetsuit scraps and adhesive. That is the prototype of a surf pad made from recycled neoprene. We have to refine this model before we can market it. We're also developing surf pads made from recycled flip-flops. The only problem is ensuring their durability. For us, it's crucial to stop microparticles getting shed into the sea. They are well on their way to being able to completely recycle old wetsuits. Now they have to sell the idea of their traction pads to a sports equipment company to help protect our oceans. Ciccio Marangioni cannot live from idealism alone either. The mussel farmer can only afford to use the bioplastic nets if the yield is acceptable. This net is made from matter B. As you can see, the mussels are bigger than the ones grown in plastic nets. That was also what we discovered in our first two test runs. We measure the size, the length, breadth and weight of the shells and the flesh. We found that mussels bred in matter B nets grow bigger and more quickly compared to those in polypropylene. In the experiment, we had control groups growing in polypropylene at the same time in the same environment. Initial findings have also been positive in terms of biodiversity. More tiny organisms were discovered growing on the mussels farmed in bioplastic nets. But there are disadvantages too. If food plants like maize are instead used to produce shopping bags or nets, then valuable cropland is being lost. And research is still being conducted to find out how biodegradable matter B is in water. The marine biologists are carrying out their first experiments with bioplastic bags in Mar Piccolo. Every type of material that doesn't belong to the natural environment has some kind of impact. But we hope that plant-based materials have less of an impact on the marine environment. They might be broken down more quickly, for example, in fishes' stomachs. Ciccio Marangioni has been working with nets made from matter B for about two years now. In comparison to plastic, matter B is very weak. It begins to break down after being in water for 18 months. That means the fish can free themselves from the nets. With plastic, that's not the case. You can't pull it apart, no matter how hard you try. The researchers' experiments show that matter B does decompose in water more quickly than normal plastic. But fishers and mussel farmers will need a material that is both strong enough and biodegradable. 
questo tipo di retina è This type of net can only be used here at the moment. The material will have to be developed and made more robust for farming in the open sea. What works here in these sheltered waters by Taranto doesn't work everywhere, but it is being tested elsewhere. Plastic should be stopped from getting into water in the first place, including via our drainage system. Biologist Leandra Hamann is developing a filtration system inspired by sea squirts, flamingos and mackerel. I'm looking at how they filter water, at the morphology of their mouths, which enables them to remove their food from water. And I'm abstracting those ideas technologically so that hopefully at some point a washing machine filter will exist that can retain the microplastics shed from our clothes. Sports clothing and fleeces shed synthetic fibers when they're being washed. About 500,000 tons of microplastics from clothing end up in the oceans each year. In Germany, those particles are largely removed during the wastewater treatment process, but up to 90% of them remain in the effluent sludge that's frequently used as fertilizer. Leandra Hamann wants to avoid microplastics reaching the food chain. So you put water from the washing machine up here and it passes through the filter. You can see the clean water coming out the other end. In tests, up to 98% of the microplastic fibers were trapped by the filter. It's a filter that was inspired by fish, a bionic filter. We can't show it yet because it might be the subject of a patent. But you could, in principle, replicate this fish filter mechanism and consider whether it could be used more broadly to tackle the microplastics problem. For example, in sections of road where a lot of microplastics get shed from tires. Particles from tire wear represents the single largest source of environmental microplastics pollution in Germany, nearly a kilogram per person per year. In comparison, plastic pellets account for 182 grams per person per year, while 19 grams comes from cosmetics. But these statistics are all based on estimates. In the future, real figures should show how important it is to act swiftly to protect our rivers and seas. Leandra Hamann could provide the necessary information with her filtration technique. The filter we've developed could also be used to filter microplastics here, probably just for monitoring purposes, to see the volume of microplastics present in the Rhine. I think it would be relatively simple to install here. It's not that big. It could be left to run for a certain time, and then we could check what was trapped in the filter. The aim of the Kraka litter collector is to ensure that measures and laws are adopted to stem the plastic tide. In the meantime, it's helping to make the Rhine that little bit cleaner. In Bordeaux, the three young entrepreneurs are looking for companies willing to sell their surf accessories made from recycled materials. The French surf brand Oxbow has expressed an interest in their surf pads. We are upcycling something we all wear in summer, flip-flops. You could collect them for us and then sell the products we make from them in your stores. We already collect flip-flops, but we don't know what to do with them. There's no recycling process for them. So that's really important for us. Since 2022, companies selling goods in France have been obliged to take back and recycle used sports and leisure items. Brands like Oxbow benefit from the startup recycling its flip-flops and wetsuits. And Nomad Surfing has gained an important partner and somewhere to retail its products. And that's just the beginning. 
Traction pads are only used by very few people, but we have other possible solutions and other projects. Other industries are interested in the materials we're developing. Automakers, boat makers and interior designers should already be offering their customers high-tech upcycled or recycled materials. This partnership is a big step forwards. And Nomad Surfing is already holding talks with other companies who want to ride the recycling wave with them. Muscle producer and wholesaler Franco Dandria also wants to switch away from plastic. But he farms on the open sea. And he knows nets made of normal plastic can withstand those conditions. If we farmed mussels in a net made of bioplastics, then the entire harvest could be lost after three or four months. I can't listen to my heart. I bear responsibility for ten families who need to put food on their table. They have to pay their taxes and bills. But we're trying to come up with a good compromise. The mussel producer is testing different kinds of nets together with a research institute. They're made of natural materials like jute, sisal and hemp, and therefore fully biodegradable. Did you make that? Yes, the long one too. This net is made from sisal, a fiber from an agave plant that also grows here. We're mainly monitoring the material's durability and robustness. Franco D'Andrea is putting it to the test. The sisal net has to be able to withstand the 18-month-long production cycle in the sea. Of course I'm optimistic, because I know that there is a sustainable, natural alternative. We just have to really put in the effort to find it. It's inconceivable that humans can't find a viable alternative to plastic. And if I can do my bit, I'm happy to. And the first impression is promising. Excellent. It's not coming apart. It holds the muscles all together really well. What the two mussel farmers from southern Italy are trying is just the beginning. But it shows that natural materials or bioplastics could be real alternatives. I'm protecting the environment and at the same time exploiting it to feed my family. It's up to us to find methods and technologies to ensure that our mussels become more valued. The new nets are helping to make mussels from Taranto stand out from those that come from elsewhere in the world. There are few ecosystems that are so much at risk from plastic as our seas and oceans. Any idea that helps us to avoid, replace or recycle these products is, for many species, a matter of life and death. <laughs>